Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the morning service at Moments Orthodox Presbyterian Church in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A few announcements. Uh, one is that we will be serving the Lord's Supper next Lord's Day. Uh, so there is one change to the bulletin we'll be doing preparatory today uh, instead of the encouragement for Christian living. Also, uh, Gems is going to be meeting this Thursday from 3.30 to 5. And the offer totals are in the bulletin. We do extend our Christian sympathy to uh, the Beeshold family. Uh, so please be in prayer for the Beesholds as they mourn uh, the death of Rich. Let us come before the Lord our God and prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of the living God with silent prayer. stand for our call to worship from Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be present among us today. Please turn with me to hymn number 179, Hallelujah, Thine the Glory, 179. <laughs> Of the cup. 
Let all of us then examine our lives and considering our own sin and the wrath of God on it, be sure that we humble ourselves in repentance before God. Let us examine our hearts to be sure that we trust in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation, and that we believe our sins are forgiven wholly by grace for the sake of our Lord's sacrifice on the cross. Finally, let us examine our consciences to be sure that we resolve to live in faith and obedience before our Lord and in love and peace with our neighbors. God will surely receive at the table of his Son all who truly repent of their sins, believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and desire to do his will. All those, however, who do not repent, who do not put their trust in the Lord Jesus, and who have no desire to lead a godly life, are warned according to the command of God to keep themselves from the Holy Sacrament. If we are living in disobedience to Christ and in enmity with our neighbors, we must repent of our sin and reconcile ourselves to our neighbors before we come to the Lord's table. For if we partake of the sacrament in unbelief and willful disobedience, we even drink judgment to ourselves. This solemn warning is not designed, however, to discourage penitent sinners from coming to the Holy Sacrament. We do not come to the supper as though we were righteous in ourselves, but rather to testify that we are sinners and that we look to Jesus Christ for our salvation. Although we do not have perfect faith, and do not serve and love God with all our hearts, and though we do not love our neighbors as we ought, we are confident that the Savior accepts us at his table when we come in humble faith, with sorrow for our sins, and with a will to follow him as he commands. And since it is necessary for us to come to the sacrament in good conscience, we urge any who lack this confidence to seek from the minister or any elder of this church such counsel as may quiet their consciences or lead to the conversion of their lives. Let us respond with hymn number 122, God, all nature sings thy glory, 122.
Our expository reading for the morning is Judges chapter 18, which is found on page 256 in the Church Bible. Here we have a perfect example of a group of people from the tribe of Dan doing what was right in their own eyes because there was no king in Israel and the force of law had almost no effect whatsoever. So we remember Micah from chapter 17, who had his own personal priest, a Levite, and these people from Dan go to Micah and steal both the priest and all of the household gods that Micah had in his house. Incidentally, there's a perfect example of the logical fallacy called ad baculum, the argument of the club which is basically, I'm right or I'm going to beat you up. And you can see that in the people of Dan in verse 25. Do not let your voice be heard amongst us, lest angry fellows fall upon you and you lose your life. So that Micah asked, what are you doing? You're taking all this stuff. And the Dan said, I, I, I wouldn't talk too loudly if I were you, or we're going to uh, kill you. Um, so here we see there, the need for leadership is getting very desperate. The need for godly leadership, the need for the rule of law, and the need for Jesus, in fact. That people really do get this bad without salvation from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is uh, the word of our God, Judges 18. In those days there was no king in Israel. In those days the tribe of the people of Dan was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in, for until then, no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. So the people of Dan sent five able men from the whole number of their tribe, from Zorah and from Eshtaol, to spy out the land and to explore it. They said to them, Go and explore the land. They came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. When they were by the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. And they turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What is your business here? He said to them, This is how Micah dealt with me. He has hired me, and I have become his priest. They said to him, Inquire of God, please, that we may know whether the journey on which we are setting out will succeed. The priest said to them, Go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. Then the five men departed and came to Laish, and saw the people who were there, how they lived in security, after the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and unsuspecting, lacking nothing that is in the earth and possessing wealth. How they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with anyone. When they came to their brothers at Zorah and Eshtaol, their brothers said to them, What do you report? They said, Arise and let us go up against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. Will you do nothing? Do not be slow to go, to enter in and possess the land. As soon as you go, you will come to an unsuspecting people. The land is spacious, for God has given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is in the earth. So 600 men of the tribe of Dan, armed with weapons of war, set out from Zorah and Eshtaol, and went up and encamped at Kiryat Yarim in Judah. On this account, that place is called Mahane Dan to this day. And behold, it is west of Kiryat Yarim. And they passed on from there to the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. Then the five men who had gone to scout out the country of Laish said to their brothers, Do you know that in these houses there are an ephod, household gods, a carved image and a metal image. Now therefore consider what you will do. They turned aside there, came to the house of the young Levite at the home of Micah and asked him about his welfare. Now the 600 men of the Danites, armed with their weapons of war, stood by the entrance of the gate. The five men who had gone to scout out the land went up and entered and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods and the metal image, while the priest stood by the entrance of the gate with the 600 men armed with weapons of war. And when these went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, the priest said to them, What are you doing? They said to him, Keep quiet. Put your hand on your mouth and come with us and be to us a father and priest. Is it better for you to be a priest to the house of one man or to be priest to a tribe and clan in Israel? The priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod and the household gods and the carved image and went along with the people. So they turned and departed, putting the little ones and the livestock and the goods in front of them. When they had gone a distance from the home of Micah, the men who were in the houses near Micah's house were called out, and they overtook the people of Dan. And they shouted to the people of Dan, who turned around and said to Micah, 
What is the matter with you that you come with such a company? And he said, You take my gods that I made and the priest and go away, and what have I left? How then do you ask me, What is the matter with you? The people of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard amongst us, lest angry fellows fall upon you, and you lose your life with the lives of your household. And the people of Dan went their way. When Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his home. But the people of Dan took what Micah had made, and the priests who belonged to him, and they came to Laish, to a people quiet and unsuspecting, and struck them with the edge of the sword, and burned the city with fire. There was no deliverer, because it was far from Sidon, and they had no dealings with anyone. It was in the valley that belongs to Beit Rehov. Then they rebuilt the city and lived in it. They named the city Dan, after the name of Dan their ancestor, who was born to Israel. But the name of the city was Laish at the first. The people of Dan set up the carved image for themselves, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan and Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up Micah's carved image that he made, as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. Let us come before the Lord our God in prayer. O Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, creator of all that is, visible and invisible, creator of the sun, moon, and stars, creator of the angels, creator of all animate and life on earth, we praise you. We praise you that you have made a beautiful universe for us to live in. Let the sun, moon, and stars proclaim your glory day after day, night after night. We praise you for your power, that it is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. We praise you, Father, that your power is exerted in this earth, not only in creation, but in ordering all history. We thank you that you are in charge and we are not. For we know from experience what a mess we make of things. We confess our sin before you, Father. We confess that sin lives in us in our sin nature, and that we do not love you as we ought, and we do not love our neighbor as ourselves. We confess to comparing ourselves with our neighbors, thinking to minimize our own sin thereby. We confess to the sin of pride, desiring to be you, desiring to limit somehow your power and your sovereignty. We confess before you that our hearts and our actions and our words do not conform with what your law states. And we acknowledge, Father, what we deserve, which is only condemnation. But we praise you, Father, that you did not leave us in our pitiable state. We praise you that you sent your Son to redeem us from our sins to accomplish the way of forgiveness, that the blood of Christ cleanses us from our sin and iniquity, that we can have the complete forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus. We pray, Father, that you will give us thankful hearts for this salvation that is in Christ, that you will increase our faith with the truth of your scriptures, we thank you that you have revealed yourself, your ways, we, that you have revealed your purpose in history to head up all things in Jesus Christ and to create an everlasting kingdom that will never perish and to people it with an innumerable group of people. We thank you, Father, that your purposes will come to pass and that no one can stop you and say, what are you doing? We thank you that this is you to whom we pray, for we know that you can change things. We thank you, Father, for your grace in our lives, resurrecting us from spiritual death to spiritual life, so that we want you, so that we desire you, that relationship that we can have with you and that we can be your children and not your enemy. 
We thank you for your grace in sending your Holy Spirit to dwell in us so that the warfare with our sin nature can begin. And that over the course of our lifetimes, we can increase in holiness and grace. We pray that you will finish in us what you have started and that you will encourage us to do the work that you have ordained for us to do, that you can help us, Father, to do that work, to tell others about Jesus, to show the love of Christ to a dying world, and to tell people there is life in Christ. We thank you, Father, for the sacrifice of Christ, that he is the temple, that he is the great high priest, that he is the sacrifice, that he is the altar, that he is everything the sacrificial system pointed towards. So that we can have not only a glimpse from your Old Testament scriptures, but also know where that heads because we have the New Testament clarity to help us understand the Old Testament. And we pray, Father, you will give us clear minds and clear hearts this day, that we will worship you in spirit and in truth, as we pray, Father, for the entire church globally, that it will preach the truth of your word, that sinners will be convicted of their sin and see their need of Jesus, that your name will be glorified above every other name, that we will bow before your name, as every knee will eventually bow, willingly or unwillingly, to the Son of God. We pray that you will bless our service of worship. May it be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer, and that we may honor your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn with me to hymn number 156. O Lord, how shall I meet you? Number 156. We'll stand and sing together.
we come to your word, your great revelation of the plan that you have for us all, for salvation, for glory for your name. We pray that your Holy Spirit will dwell within us and apply these words to us, that we may see the glory of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn the scriptures to Exodus chapter 27. We'll read verses 1 through 8. This is page 79. And then read the first seven verses of chapter 38. This is Exodus chapter 27, verses 1 through 8. Hear now God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. You shall make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be square and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make horns for it on its four corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. You shall make pots for it to receive its ashes, and shovels and basins and forks and fire pans. You shall make all its utensils of bronze. You shall also make for it a grating, a network of bronze, and on the net you shall make four bronze rings at its four corners. You shall set it under the ledge of the altar, so that the net extends halfway down the altar. And you shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. And the poles shall be put through the rings, so that the poles are on the two sides of the altar when it is carried. You shall make it hollow with boards. As it has been shown you on the mountain, so shall it be made. And then chapter 38 verses 1 through 7. He made the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood. Five cubits was its length and five cubits its breadth. It was square and three cubits was its height. He made horns for it on its four corners. Its horns were of one piece with it, and he overlaid it with bronze. And he made all the utensils of the altar, the pots, the shovels, the basins, the forks, and the fire pans. He made all its utensils of bronze. And he made for the altar a grating, a network of bronze under its ledge, extending halfway down. He cast four rings on the four corners of the bronze grating as holders for the poles. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. And he put the poles through the rings on the sides of the altar to carry it with them. He made it hollow with boards. If you were an Israelite in the time of Moses and Aaron, and you needed to go into the tabernacle area, you would open the screen to the courtyard, and the first thing you would see would be this bronze altar. There was to be a perpetual fire underneath that altar. And so you would always see an altar at work. And the fire that perpetually burned beneath the altar was the symbol of the complete and unceasing holiness of God, and yet a holiness that communicates grace to God's people. No one could enter the tabernacle without a sacrifice. The altar stood in the way of anyone going into the tabernacle itself. So without the sacrifice for sins, there is no forgiveness. And also, no communion with the Lord. So it is that in speaking about the altar today, we speak of things that are central to the Christian faith because we're talking about Christ's sacrifice for, his sin, for our sins. The dimensions of the altar are large. It is seven and a half feet long and seven and a half feet wide, a square. Of course, it wouldn't be very high, only four and a half feet high because of the difficulty of getting slain animals on top of the altar. But right away we're confronted with something difficult. Why would the altar be made of wood? Wouldn't it simply burn up? And add to that the fact that if the wood even was, if the wood was covered with bronze, there's still the problem of the bronze getting hot enough that it might ignite the wood. Well, we get two clues about this problem from verses 4 and 5 when we compare that with chapter 20, verses 24 and 25. The first clue we get is that the grate, or the network of bronze, was to be about halfway up the height of the altar. It implies that the fire itself would be underneath that grating. 
And add to that verse 8, which tells us that the altar described here is hollow on the inside, while the outside is made of wood overlaid with bronze. It indicates that the altar described here is actually a sort of outer shell, a square shell. And that brings us to what chapter 20, verses 24 and 25 say. There we learn that the altar has to be made of earth or uncut stones. And there it makes no mention of the fact that a few chapters later on there would be commands for making an altar of bronze. So how do we fit these passages together? The solution is that the bronze altar described here is that square outer shell, while underneath the grating was the altar of earth or of stones. So the earth or stones would be receiving the lion's share of the heat, while the wood overlaid with bronze provided the framework for the altar on which the animal would rest. It raises the question, why does it have to be this way? Well, practically speaking, the Israelites needed a movable altar that would keep the forgiveness of sins front and center for them all the time. Whenever they were in the wilderness, wherever they would be in the wilderness, there would be plenty of stones and earth that could be used to be the place where the fire would burn. But they always needed to be reminded then of their sin and what it costs to get rid of that sin. And that's just as true of us today, isn't it? We need the sacrifice of Christ front and center in our lives so that we'll always remember what it cost Jesus to take away our sin. Now, the altar is overlaid with bronze. It's worthwhile noting at this point that the precious materials of which the tabernacle was made become less and less valuable the further you get from the most holy place. In the most holy place, everything is gold. In the holy place, there's some gold, but there's a lot of silver. And outside where the altar is, in the courtyard, everything is bronze. That shows us how precious a thing it is to be in the presence of God. And not only is it precious, valuable to be in the presence of God, but it costs something for us to gain that access. For the Israelite, it cost a sacrifice. And even then, most Israelites could not enjoy, directly at least, God's immediate presence. The priests would have to experience that presence for them, vicariously. The altar is as far as most Israelites ever got to the presence of God. The altar would therefore be a very instructive, instrument in the hands of God. God would use that altar to teach his people about forgiveness, sacrifice, and the people's need for a substitute. One of the most interesting features about the altar is the horns that were at the four corners. It is said in both passages relating to this that the horns were of one piece with the rest of the altar. That's, that's important to the description. Why? They were not optional add-ons, they were an essential part of the altar. And what has confused many people over the centuries is the meaning of these horns. Why were they necessary? Well, there's both practical and symbolic aspects to the answer of that question. Practically speaking, the horns are the place where the animals would be tied in preparation for their slaughter. We read in the call to worship, Psalm 118, 27, God is the Lord, and He has given us Light, bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. In that context of that verse, the prophecies about the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Plainly, Jesus is, as it were, lurking right around the corner. The sacrifice was held to the altar at the horns. And many of the sacrifices would, of course, themselves have horns. Those animals with horns being tied to the horns indicates the very close relationship there is between the sacrifice and the altar, or the place where the sacrifice occurs. Though the horns were the symbolic way of identifying the animal with the sacrifice. 
The horns would be pointing upwards, showing the worshiper in what direction the sacrifice had to go. We know also that horns symbolize strength. So it is that this strength of the animal is burned in such a way that the sacrifice goes upwards. So ultimately the horns tell us the animal is given to God. People, therefore, over time came to realize that having a sacrifice at the altar was safe for them. Safety was there. They knew they needed their sins forgiven, and so they tied their animals to the horns of the altar. And perhaps that's why the horns came to be a place of safety for someone who was fleeing the wrath of somebody else. Maybe you remember that Joab, when he is fleeing Solomon's wrath in the beginning of 1 Kings, goes to the temple and takes hold of the horns of the altar. And he's trying to say by that action that he's dedicated to the Lord, that he's giving his strength to God such that he should be spared. But in that case, of course, Joab's actions were only a profaning of the horns of the altar. And Solomon's men removed him from those horns and executed him. Joab was treating the altar like it was some sort of magic charm that could protect him from justice. That's hardly what the altar was all about. So Solomon's men were right to take him from the altar and execute him for his crimes. There's just one problem with the altar. You see, there's the perpetual fire, and there's always offerings being slain and burned on the altar. And every time a person sinned, he owed an animal to God. And the unceasing fire of God's holiness that burned on the altar was never satisfied by the burning animals, as Hebrews tells us. The blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. All that blood, all that smoke, all those animals killed, and for what? Did they take away sin? Not in and of themselves. They always pointed forward to the one perfect sacrifice that did take away sins. What they needed was a once-for-all sacrifice that would forever quench that flame on the altar. So ultimately speaking, the Israelite who offered up an animal in sacrifice was really exercising faith in Jesus. That there would one day come a sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Isn't it marvelous that Jesus Christ came to offer that one perfect sacrifice? He offered up all his strength to God. To use the biblical metaphor, he offered up his horns to God. To the unceasing cleansing fire of God. He did that as our substitute. You see, every time an Israelite offered an animal on the altar, what he was saying is that he knows it should have been him on that altar. The animal was a substitute. And so also is Christ, our substitute. He took on the unceasing burning fire of the infinitely holy God. He is the reality to which the altar, the sacrifice, the tabernacle, the lampstand, the table of showbread, the bread itself, the priesthood, all points to Jesus Christ. But the question for us is this, have we laid hold of the horns of the new altar? Have we laid hold of the strength of Jesus Christ as our substitute? Do we believe that Jesus Christ took on himself the curse of the law for sin, while he himself was without sin, and thus able to be our substitute? Do we believe in the perfection of that offering? Do we believe no other sacrifice is required for the forgiveness of sins? Do we believe that Jesus was fully human, thus able to take our place? Do we believe that he was fully God, thus able to bear up under the sins of all of his people? The problem with a lot of people is that they don't think they need this salvation. The problem is not helped by many evangelism programs that start with the love of God. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Well, perhaps, 
Yes, that's true. But as a starting point, the problem with that is that if people don't recognize there's a problem, why are they going to search for a solution? The love of God, you see, is the solution to our problem. But if we don't see we have a problem, why are we even going to think we need a solution? If there's nothing wrong, there's nothing to fix. One of the things we can do then is to point out the significance of the animal sacrifices. That the person offering them was making a statement of faith that it should have been him on that altar. This is why we preach law. One of the reasons why we preach law. In order to show that the standard is not our neighbor. That's not the standard of conduct. The standard of conduct is God's law, which is and requires absolute perfection. And as Paul says very clearly in Romans, we all are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. The penalty for that sin is burning on the altar. We're talking about the fires of hell itself. We are called to flee that wrath and lay hold of the horns of the altar. Jesus Christ himself, that is the only safe place. The horns of that altar are strong enough to withstand the very hottest fires of the wrath of God. For those of us who have done so, we have an inexpressibly sweet opportunity to offer ourselves as a very different kind of sacrifice to God. Paul tells us in Romans 12 that we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God. You see how much grace there is, you see, in that one word, living. Who ever heard of a living sacrifice? The Old Testament does not explicitly talk about this kind of thing. It talks about dead sacrifices. All the sacrifices of the Old Testament were dead sacrifices, but because Jesus Christ has offered the final one, no more dead sacrifices are required. And yet, now he lives. Therefore, we live too. Our sacrifice is that we offer ourselves up to the service of God. This is only reasonable. It is completely logical. In fact, that's actually what Romans 12, 1 says. This, which is your reasonable or logical service. Why is it that's, what is it that's logical about it? Well, because Jesus offered up himself as the perfect sacrifice for sins, we offer up ourselves with gratitude for what Christ has done. This is only logical. We don't do that, of course, in order to pay God back. Paul just got finished telling us at the end of chapter 11 that no one can give anything to God in such a way as to put God in debt. From him and to him and through him are all things. But it does mean we have gratitude. And that gratitude needs expression in the Christian life. So we offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Well, what does that mean? Most of all, it means that we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Instead of seeking our own private kingdom, we sacrifice many things. Selfish ambition. We sacrifice pride. We sacrifice vanity. We sacrifice the sort of one-upmanship where we want to look better than somebody else. We sacrifice our fleshly desires. We sacrifice our desires. There's a wonderful quotation from the book about the Spiritual Armor, written by William Gurnall. 
where he says to offer up your lusts upon the altar, and that before you enjoy one more instance of it. It says our lusts will not sit on the altar as quietly as Isaac did, but will lament pitiably, wanting us to be more kind to them. But we are to sacrifice them and have no pity on our lusts. In short, we sacrifice anything that gets in the way of our relationship to God. That's what we are called to sacrifice. We are to give ourselves all out in the service of God. Our problem is, most of the time, we try to reserve something for ourselves. We'll serve God when it's convenient, when it doesn't get in the way of our own pleasures. But the minute anyone suggests to us that we ought to give something up because it's getting in the way, well, that's the time to initiate World War III. But remember this, the sacrifices of the altar, they don't leave anything behind. They are completely given to God. Now why wouldn't we want to do that? when Jesus gave himself completely for us. Let us pray. Lord our God, the sacrifice of Christ is marvelous in our eyes. And yes, it's horrific, Lord, because that is the God-man sacrificing himself for us. And we don't want to think, Lord, that our sin is so bad that that's the only way we can be saved. But you have taught in your word it is just that bad. That our sin is just that black. And so teach us, Father, through the bronzed altar, the blackness of our sins, and the much greater glory of what Christ has done and the salvation that is in him, and therefore, what our gratitude should look like. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn with me to hymn number 667. We'll stand and sing, God is my strong salvation, 667.
And we pray, Father, that our gratitude will be measured in our response. We pray that you will bless these tithes and offerings and expand your kingdom work through them to the honor and glory of your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. 